Well, good evening and welcome to this March 9th version of Hill Beyond, Insightful Conversations with our alumni. I'm your host, Headmaster Zach Lehman. And depending on your perspective, this is either a really exciting night or a sad night because it is our last episode of Hill Beyond for the season. Um, this is number six and we've had a terrific run and we're going to end on a high note for sure. Uh, tonight's guest is Pinkney Benedict, class of 82, and our working title for tonight is You Can't, you're, oh, it's spelled wrong there, You Can't Take the Appalachian Out of the Boy. Uh, maybe it's spelled right, I don't know. Um, and our guest is Pinkney Benedict, class of 82, award-winning author and founder and director of the Digital Humanities Lab of Southern Illinois College of Liberal Arts. Uh, so what do we know about our special guest, Pinkney Benedict? First of all, he has a, uh, he's part of the special haircut club like me. Uh, so we were talking about that before the show, a perfect dome. Uh, Pinckney Benedict grew up on his family's dairy farm in Greenbrier County, West Virginia. He attended the Hill School, Princeton University and the Iowa Writers Workshop, a famous uh, hotbed for writers. He has published a novel, Dogs of God and three collections of short fiction. The most recent of which is Miracle Boy and Other Stories. His work has been published in, among other magazines and anthologies, Esquire, Zoetrope, All Story, the O. Henry Award Series, the Pushcart Prize Series, the Best New Stories from the South Series, Apocalypse Now, Poems and Prose from the End of Days, the, e the Echo Anthology of Contemporary American Short Fiction, and the Oxford Book of the American Short Story. Benedict is a recipient of, among other awards and honors, a literature fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, a fiction grant from the Illinois Arts Council, two Platner Awards for fiction from Appalachian Heritage Magazine, a literary fellowship from the West Virginia Commission on the Arts, and the Chicago Tribune's Nelson Algren Award. Benedict has taught on the writing faculties of, among other institutions, Oberlin, Princeton, Davidson, Ohio State, the Ohio State University, West Virginia, Queens University of Charlotte, and, uh, and Hollins University, and he currently serves as professor in the MFA program and undergraduate fiction program at Southern Illinois University, Carbondale. Upon becoming senior fiction writer in the creative writing program at SIUC in 2018, Benedict established a podcasting lab, which in cooperation with SIU Press and WSIU, Southern Illinois regional NPR affiliate, produces the Blanket Fort Radio Theater podcast and serial audiobook program. Audio work produced in the podcasting facility has won first prize and three runners up in 2019 and 20 from the Miller Audio Prize competition hosted by the Missouri Review. The podcasting lab will begin publication of its own monthly audio magazine, Earworm Labs, in February 2021. He's founder of the Digital Humanities Lab of SIUC's College of Liberal Arts, a virtual reality simulation and game design facility tasked with pursuing the future of fiction and the pedagogy of digital narrative. His short story volume, Papa Whiskey Tango, New and Selected Stories is due out from Press 53 in late 2021. The project that he's pursuing during, during his current sabbatical is titled Rise and Slaughter, a born digital visual novel based on Xenophone's Anabasis, which he first encountered as a fourth former at the Hill. Well, we mentioned it, there he is, and there's Greenbrier County, West Virginia. I did a little map here, a little Google Maps. You can see there's apparently two good ways to get there, but both of them take a long time. So that was his route uh, back in the early 80s and late 70s when he attended Hill. Um, but you know, we, we can't let this go without a little bit of embarrassment here. Pinckney in his sixth form uh, portrait there, some pretty cool shades. Not sure who the, the girl is there. Um, that's, uh, you know, always uh, interesting in the 80s when we were all boys. Some interesting car shops there, some hats to wear. Uh, let's see here, he was editor in chief of the Hill News, that makes sense. And the dial chairman and the record, you know, a lot of writing and publications. Pinkney, are you there? We need you to uh come forward and show yourself i'll do the same here we will go here we go when was the last time you saw these pictures i it, it's been a long time i uh i remember having that hair i but that's pretty fabulous hair if you ask me 
When, when, when did you make the decision to, you know, do this beautiful thing that we did? Well, I, I was losing my hair. I mean, early on, probably, you know, in my twenties. Um, and, uh, but, but then I, I got married in um, 1990 and my wife liked me to keep kind of what I had, but then I, I uh, uh, had cancer. I had to have chemotherapy uh, about 20 years ago now. And when I was in the hospital, my, you know, my hair was getting all funky from the chemo. And so my wife shaved my head and it, it was a revelation to her. She decided that that was, uh, that was, that was fine with her now. And so, so for yeah. the last 20 years or so, I've, you know, every day I, I just take an electric razor and go over the, go over the, what little Fritlands there are. Yeah. I, I know this is really not a fun topic of conversation for anyone listening, but I, I maybe 15 years ago did, uh, I just came down one morning. I was just sick and tired of not having much hair and just shaved it. And uh, my daughter said, you know, daddy's hair fell out or something like that. She was a little girl at the time. I can't remember the exact line. My wife would remember. Um, well, anyway, these are good pictures. Who's the girl in the picture? Anyone we know? That That is uh, Patty Smithson, who was, uh, she was from uh, uh, Alderson, uh, West Virginia. Uh, and she was my uh, girlfriend when I was in uh, fifth and sixth form. So, uh, you know, come up for, you come up for dances and things like that. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it was a, there was a dance in the fall. Cause I believe that was in fall of 81. That, that would have been my sixth form year. I've heard um, some legendary so, stories about those dances. Uh, oh know, boy. Bus loads, right. Coming in and nope, that's, that's exactly uh, correct. And staying we for the go, weekend, go to a game or two. Taking a bus trip to Westover, uh, school. Mm-hmm. I mean, we would go hours and hours uh, to go places and, and folks would come in and that kind of thing. I actually didn't go to all that many, uh, all that many dances, but, uh, but when, when Patty could come up, uh, we would, we would go to stuff. So let's talk a little bit about Greenbrier County. I'm putting that map back up on the screen. Sure. Uh, so I have a little familiarity with West Virginia. My son actually lives in Fayetteville, oh, okay. um, uh, in the, in the New River Gorge area. He's mm-hmm. going to yeah. school down there and doing a lot of rock climbing. So, Talk to us about Greenbrier County. What what was it like then, and how is it different today, if any, if if at all? Well, yeah, I mean Greenbrier County. What it, what Greenbrier County is famous for, and most folks who have heard of Greenbrier County is uh, the Greenbrier uh, Hotel, the Greenbrier Resort, um, which is it's it is just pretty much due east of my family's uh, farm. My, it, it was a dairy farm for many years, um, and in the last two or three years, my my brother, who was class of 76, I think. Uh, but my brother Cooper uh, uh, it manages the farm and my dad, you know, is still involved. Um, and dad was class of 53. Um, and uh, so but they've converted it over to a, it's a grazing uh, operation now. They graze uh, Angus for Whole Foods, I think. Um, hmm. And uh, but uh, but uh, it, it was um, uh, it's a it's an agricultural valley it's it's not when people think of west virginia um they you know they often think of mining and stuff like that and that's not our our, my county is uh it's it's on a very high plateau it's at about a 2400 foot elevation and uh the land is pretty flat on that plateau we've got ridges the 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 western ridge of the of the blue ridge you can see from my family's farm um and then but but it's a it's kind of a wide it's what they call the big levels um and so so it's it's agricultural i mean we you know angus we had all my friends were angus farmers kids and you know we had a we had a dairy farm which was pretty unusual there uh and that kind of thing but now it's much more it was really an agricultural town um, but now it's a it's a it's a kind of a tourist town. There's lots of you know quilt shops and shops selling art and little coffee shops and and things like that. But it was Cowtown uh, when I was a kid. You could lie down in the middle of the main street at noon and and you wouldn't get hit. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I learned when I had spent some time in West Virginia, you know, uh, around the Civil War. Um, the you know West Virginia and Virginia took different sides, and it right. it it was because of the way the rivers flowed. Um, West Virginia, uh, the rivers flew, uh, flowed north and, and west towards Ohio and Pennsylvania. And Virginia, uh, the rivers flowed south and east towards uh, the Confederacy. And so they were, they were really um, commercial alliances and they were 
keeping together. So yeah, we, West Virginians also like to think though that we were we were patriotic and and anti-slavery. But 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 I but you're I mean you're you are but we are not a southern state. There's no there's no question about that. It, it really is. Uh, uh, but you know and you, it, it, I mean it really was not. I I, I didn't grow up with. But I mean I guess there there's a statue uh, to the Confederate dead. Uh, because there's a big mass Confederate grave because there was a pretty disastrous right. battle in Lewisburg uh, for the for the Confederates. Yeah. Um, but we're right on the Virginia line, right? Yeah. We're you know we're we're as the crow flies driving. It's about 14 miles to the Virginia line, but as the crow flies, it's like five miles. So there may um, have been some divided families at that time. Oh yeah, no no no. It was it was yeah. It would have been a pretty divided area. Yeah. It. it um, uh, no, I mean that that that's exactly right. But we were, you know, we're we're classic border state that that uh, you know kind of kind of you know north not so sure about us and and uh, I remember when um, I had a book published in the in the nineties and uh, I went on tour and it was it was Doubleday was the publisher and so they would send me to places like you know Homewood, Alabama. And there would be a big banner over the the you know the, over you know where I was going to read from and sign books and say you know Pinkney Benedict Southern writer <laughs> and I'd have to explain to Alabamans you know like I didn't <laughs> that's not what you know I didn't I'm not claiming that you all are from <laughs> Alabama like I you know I'll leave that to you uh, so so it's a it's one of those areas where folks don't know how to right. you know kind of don't know how to think about it I, I believe it's one of the reasons it's fun to write about is that West Virginia is um, it's kind of like the id of America, right? Nobody, you know, it's, it's mountains, is it southern, is it northern? We don't know, you know, we, you know, we don't know anybody from there. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not overexposed yeah. in terms of, you know, literature and storytelling. Well, I told a story at graduation a few years ago. I was, uh, it's actually a funny story, but um, I was visiting my son down there for his birthday and had to fly out the next day um, from Char for, for work from Charleston to Florida and had to commute through Washington, D.C. And I got on a little, the first flight out in the morning and I took a cab ride to, from the hotel to the airport. And uh, I was talking to the drivers about 5 a.m. and the cab drivers started saying, well, you know, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Pennsylvania. He said, oh, I went to high school in Pennsylvania. I, you know, I my dad had some connections and sent me to this boarding school. I hated it. Uh, I only stayed for about a year. And I said, what was the name of that boarding school? And he said, oh, you probably never heard of it, the Hill School. And I had like a moment there, Pinkney, where I was like, should I say to him that I'm the headmaster? I really want to get into a <laughs> conversation really, with my cab good. driver. Yeah. But sure enough, I, I, I told him that oh, I was the headmaster know. there. Yeah, and, yeah. No, that's too good. You got yeah, it. and we had a nice chat. He remembered a lot of people. Um, I'm, I'm, his name is like Mike Pearlstein or something and not Pearlstein's not quite right but as I was leaving the cab he said uh I said you know you should come for your reunion you got a reunion coming up I forget his class year at the time he said I'm too busy I said too busy you know and he said yeah I'm, I'm this is just my part-time job my full-time job is I'm a, a state uh, representative in West Virginia uh, state uh, legislature and I sort of like shrugged my shoulders and got on the plane and I was flipping through my iPhone I was looking at the pages of the uh state legislature trying to capture his name you know I wanted to make sure our alumni office knew this and the guy sitting next to me leans over my shoulder and says what are you doing I said I'm trying to find this cab driver he says he's a legisl you know he's a representative and he said oh you met Mike Perlsman or whatever <laughs> I said how did you know that and he said well I used to be the governor of West Virginia and I turned to him it was Joe Manchin sitting next oh, to me wow wow uh and uh and you know I I it was an interesting plane ride and you know it's like an episode out of the west wing or well, something. that is yeah that's you know like like west virginia's just popping up uh popping <laughs> up all over the place and i yeah i mean i i remember um you know when i was when i would go to the hill you know when i was going to the hill and we if we were like on the pennsylvania turnpike or something we saw another west virginia license plate right that was always you know you'd ride up next to them and wave and point back at your own license plate i you know that's uh uh, and I've, I've never lived anywhere else where people did that, but West Virginians were, you know, we really did try to, 
you know, kind of connect with each other in that, yeah. in that well, weird way. It's a beautiful state for sure. And really interesting people. And I've come to appreciate it a lot, but oh, it is. We, we could probably talk about West Virginia for a while, but let, let's skip ahead here because sure. tomorrow is an interesting day, Pinkney. Tomorrow is March 10th. And in the boarding school world, that's the day our students find out whether they've been accepted to the Hill School. Um, so, and we may have some prospective families here on the line we've had uh, in the last five weeks. And so I'm interested to hear what either your application process or your admissions process, or even your interview. I mean, I, I know your dad was an alumnus, so, and your brother, so you had some, it wasn't totally foreign to you. Yeah, no, um, no, no. But tell me about either the day you were accepted, if you can remember, or your first day on campus. Yeah, well, I mean, it was, uh, yeah, and my granddad, if you, um, if you're in the, the, uh, uh, CFTA, my granddad was uh, the the uh, headmaster's prize, 1925. Wow, third uh, so generation. We have been, yeah, yeah, we've been, we've been weird a long time. So I remember, I remember talking to my folks and saying, we well, you know, can I look at uh, other schools? And they said, oh, sure, you can look, you're going <laughs> to the hill, but you can look all you like. And uh, so it was a foregone conclusion. I mean, I, you know, assuming I got in, there was no, and if I didn't get in, I was probably just going to be disowned and pitched out of the house. So, um, but, but it, so I knew the campus, you know, and I'd been there and, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I knew um, uh, Charles Watson, the, the son of the headmaster, you know, he and I had, had met several times when my parents were visiting my brother and, and that kind of thing. And, um, but I, uh, but it was a very different thing to arrive as a student and to realize I wouldn't be going home with my parents that night, you know, that I was, and, and, you know, I had, a, it was nice. Like I, you know, I was down in the uh, uh, Dutch village. So it was a little, you know, house like thing. And, but I, you know, it, it was, um, it was, it was really frightening. And uh, I remember uh, <laughs> this is, you know, the sort of miscellany you remember, but I remember that my roommate, was listening on the radio to uh, uh, to it, because I guess on FM you can get uh, TV stations or could in those days and he was listening to Charlie's Angels which was kind of a new program on TV and I remember thinking why would you listen to Charlie's Angels right like that 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 seemed to me not the point of Charlie's Angels and it was a uh, but it was it was you know it was a uh, uh, I, I, you know, I remember being awake a long time that first night and, uh, uh, you know, and, and really being, being worried about what was going to be demanded of me because, yeah, I mean, I'd been in public school um, in West Virginia for seven years, which, you know, I, I had good teachers and, and I had parents who, you know, believed in learning and, and that kind of thing. But I, I, I was very worried about my preparation for the school and I was right to be worried. I mean, it was, it was really demanding. I mean, what, so did, I, what did you, did you come as a second former or a third? Yeah, I was a second former back when there were second formers and I was, you know, I was a five-year boy. Um, we all were, my granddad was, my dad was, my brother was, um, uh, we're kind of addicts, I guess. Um, but it, it, you know, I mean, it, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was really challenging. Got up the next day, went to Latin class uh, had never had a language before, sat down, you know, I was in, uh, um, you know, Henry Woodward, who was a son of a longtime uh, history teacher was in that class, Niels Groton, who was the uh, son of uh, Dr. Groton, Dr. Groton. Yeah. Who, who's uh, chair of, the, of classics, um, uh, Charles Watson, uh, uh, you know, junior was in that class, they'd all had lots it was of like Latin. a who's who of hill legacy and oh it's really it was it was a funny year to be there with those folks and and very intimidating and uh uh and so to be in in a latin class with with those guys and i'm pretty competitive about that kind of thing so it was uh uh that was it was a real race i mean i i uh you know i i tell everybody like the hill was great preparation because it, everything else has been a piece of cake by comparison. You know, uh, I remember hearing the guy, Terry Jones, I think his name is Terry Jones, but he was a, he was a hostage in Iran for five, six years, something like that. And they said to him, well, you know, how did you, you know, how did you survive? He says, oh, he says, that was no problem. I went to Harrow. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know, he said, I spent five years at Harrow. And I've always kind of felt like that. Like, I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that 
you know, boarding school is comparable to being a prisoner of war. Right? <laughs> well, it's tougher. I mean, it, you know, but, but the, uh, his other point, which I, which I really take to heart and uh, was that, was that Harrow gave him um, like he, he had memorized a lot of poetry. And so a lot of what he spent time doing was reciting to himself the poetry that he had, you know, he was forced to learn it. He didn't want to do it, but it turned out to be the thing that saved his life and his sanity. Mm. Um, at the time of his utmost uh, necessity, right? Us utmost exigency. And so, so I, I've thought about, you know, like, like nothing, nothing has ever been as tough for me as that first night, that first week, that first list. I don't, do you all still call them lists or do you have terms now? Uh, some people still do. I mean, we now call them a midterm. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But well, yeah that, that, that language comes around once in a while for those who, of us who've been here for a while. And Right. Yeah. You know. Well, lists was, but, but I mean, that was the toughest, that was no, no question about the toughest part of my life because yeah. I mean, I really hadn't been, I'd never been to summer camp. I'd never been, I'd never been anywhere. Um, and the term list, which, uh, don't know that everyone really understands why they called it that but it's because they would list your grades they put yeah, them up on the board well that's how we found out our grades right. was we would we would go into what was then middle uh middle school which is now where the uh academic classroom uh, yeah, yeah. And, and the academic building and we would go in and there was you know it was it was the um uh there you know the the uh uh mailboxes were in there yep. and Donner Hall. Right in Donner Hall. Yep, Donner Hall. And there was you know, first and second mail, and you'd go and peer in and oh my, please let me have a letter from someone. <laughs> um, and uh uh you know, and, and then they would they would post our 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 uh, grades over there. And it was always a it was always a great struggle. And also I think we'd be I think we would be sued right now if we posted. Oh, I'm sure. There. Well, no, I mean I, I don't know how um uh FERPA applies to you all, but I mean I, as a teacher, I can't even, if a parent calls me or someone calls me and says, how did my student do? I can't even say the students in my class. Yeah. Fortunately, our kids are minors, but if we put, uh, if we posted kids grades, it would be, it'd be the end. Uh, of yeah. It. Well, but it was, it was, a, you know, it was in, in some ways a different world, in some ways similar, you know, when I come back, but it is a, um, you know, and, and I will admit, freely admit that I was one of those people who was like, oh, you know, you gotta admit girls, uh, uh, you know, I was one of those jerks um but the but the young women i've met there are amazing you know I, I mean i'm sort of glad i didn't have to compete with them i you know i had to compete with you know e eugene chen and that was you know that was bad enough eugene always uh, always kicked my butt academically um but uh, but but you know it was it was it was a different school in many ways it was it was deeply gothic um and I, yeah, when, when, did you, when did you discover, did or I should say, did you discover your passion for writing and literature um, and media at Hill? Um, well, was yeah, that your first experience with that. Well, it was. It was um, actually since we're talking about the application process and that kind of thing, I remember my uh, entry essay uh, to the school. I think the question was something like, "Tell us about a problem that you've." dealt with or solved or something like that. And I had to ride the school bus um, when I was little. We were the last stop on the school bus. And uh, there were a lot of really tough kids on the school bus. And I was kind of a weird little guy. And and they people, they did not much care for me. And my big brother helped me out. But then he went away to the hill. And so I was kind of by myself. And uh, the way, you know, the way I got through was by um, I, you know, I made friends with people by telling them stories about themselves, by just kind of making up epic adventures and, you know, and things like that. And people would let me sit with them uh, on a school bus because I, you know, I was happy to tell them stories to kind of earn my safe passage to, uh, uh, to you know, third grade. And uh, so I wrote about that, you know, and about, about storytelling and how that had, you know, it had really saved me. Um, and uh uh, yeah, I mean, because people really, you know, you're talking, you know, 1972 in Southern West Virginia, you're a guy named Pinckney, you come from a Republican political family, and West Virginia is Republican now, but in those days, it was not, it was UMWA uh, Democrat, and, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, I was getting pummeled all the time, <laughs> and so, so, so that, you know, that's really where I sort of realized, oh, I can, I can make my way through the world, 
right? And I wrote that essay and I remember hearing back from the admissions office and, you know, and then they said, oh, you know, you have no fear that you, you won't be matriculating here. And I, that was the first time I ever heard the word matriculate. Uh, I remember that and I had to, I was like, oh, I, I think that's good. Um, and I, I got that sorted out. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember all of that stuff really vividly. I mean, it's, I still dream about the Hill. I mean, I dream about the Hill. Uh, I bet, I bet it's a little less now, but I bet I dream about the Hill once a week. Wow. Well, what, who were the, um, who were the influential teachers on your experience here, maybe with writing or, or otherwise? Who were the, yeah, well, I mean, so many, uh, I mean, the, you know, sort of the first people who come to mind were, um, uh, the classics faculty, um, you know, I, I did, uh, uh, I did Greek and Latin there with, um, uh, with Dr. Urillo, um, with Dr. Groton, uh, I did, uh, Greek with Dr. Groton and that, that was a mind bendingly difficult class. And, uh, I remember thinking that learning the alphabet for Greek was going to be really, really hard. And we'd probably take the whole, you know, first list to do it. And it was overnight. He just says, okay, here, here's the book, you know, have this done by tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, but, uh, but, uh, so, you know, and Doc Finn, uh, you know, Doc Finn is one of those folks who um, also informs my teaching life. I mean, he was just, what a, what a great, like, what a great heart he had. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for the students, you know, he's just a gracious person and, you know, Doc Urillo was so funny. Um, he, he just one of the funniest, wittiest, like, you know, it, it just right off the top of his head, you know, the, the really incisive things and, you know, um, so, so classics folks, the, the, um, um, you know, Rick Walbridge, um, I was not a science guy. In fact, with Rick Walbridge, and when I, I actually taught on the faculty uh, for a year uh, uh, at Hill after I got out of graduate school, I was writer in residence there while I was a missioner fellow from Iowa. Um, and um, yeah, by the way, missioner taught at Hill. Yes. No, no, no. That was, it was, it was sort of a cool thing that I got a missioner fellowship for the year after I got out of, um, uh, after I got out of Iowa, and uh, that that paid me, so I came to Hill, and they didn't, you know, they didn't pay me a whole lot, but they gave me a an apartment, and you know, I could eat, you know, three meals a day. Um, it was a great year. It was a really, it was a wonderful, uh, it was a it was a wonderful year. But uh, I remember telling Rick Walbridge, he the the one time, and this is too insider baseball, and I apologize, but. It's, uh, you know, the grades used to go from zero to eight, right? And zero was perfection, six was failing, seven was really failing, and eight just meant don't, don't just don't bother. Like it's, uh, and uh, I had an opportunity, it was in a very short list. We had a list that was two or three weeks long. I guess it was between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I, I had a chance to get a point eight. Right. Because I, you know, I, I had one class that, you know, that, you know, that I thought I could get a zero in and I thought I had ones in all the others. And uh, Rick Walbridge gave me a two uh, in uh, biology. And I, I was and I, I, so I topped out at a 1.0 and that was as, as high as I ever got. And so he looked it up in his green book and I, I was one or two points from getting a one from him. You know, he, it was, it was, it was just. Never let him hear the end of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I've, and now I'm giving him, uh, you know, I, I hope you're there, Rick Walbridge. You were, you were the reason I never broke 1.0, but these wonderful people. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, people, Rick passed away last year. Oh, he did. Oh, I'm sorry. I, well. Okay. I, I, no, no, we had, we, Rick and I were able to work together. We, we worked together my first year here and um, obviously a very, uh, very influential oh. member of our faculty for 40 plus years. Um, yeah. I think he retired at 43 years, something like that. Wow. Some crazy amount. Wow. I mean, it, it, the, you know, people like that just, you know, I mean, you can't help but be changed by them. Yeah. Um, just by, and you, and I wasn't conscious of it at all at the time, you know, that I was among, you know, the, you know, my, my classmates, the people who are older than I was, um, people who were coming up behind me, the faculty that I was among the best people I was ever going to be among. 
Yeah. Um, but you don't, you have no idea of that. And you think you deserve it, right? You think you deserve a genius teacher like, uh, you know, like Doc Urillo. Um, and you don't, and you can't. And um, so, you know, and, and part of that, I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I love teaching, right? Is that, is that I, I realize, oh, that's, that's what teaching can do. That's, the, you know, that's the difference it can make. Um, so yeah, it was. I mean, if we if if uh, just want to fast forward a little bit. So you leave Hill, you go to Princeton, right? Mm -hmm. you, you go to grad school out in Iowa. Um, you come back. I didn't know you came back here for a year. That's an interesting yeah. It was right after grad school. I was, I was back detour. Here. Uh, you know, talking to a former faculty member. Now you got you, you're now wearing all the Hill hats. You're a grandson, a son, a brother, an alumnus, a former faculty member. Um, and, and, and even today, I know you're still involved. You, you um, generally, you do some workshops from time to time. You did one earlier this year on podcasting and, yep. and that sort of media work. And, and your name always gets mentioned at, the, uh, at our award ceremony when we do our writing awards for the Alex Rebell Writing Awards. You're one of our outside judges every year. And, um, you know, you get to read uh you know our students writing some of our I best love students that. I love and, that. and judge I, those you know, and, that's such a great way to come back to the school yeah and to see you know where they are and to think about where i was as a writer at that time and i mean you have lots of folks who are who are better writers you know at, at their age than i was when i was there it's i mean it really is uh um, you know, I mean, the Hill's a remarkable institution. I, you know, I, my family's been involved with it for, you know, coming up on, well, I bet my granddad would have arrived there about 100 years ago this year. Wow. And, um, you and was know, your grandfather alive when you came to Hill? No, he was not. He had died. Um, my dad's dad died. I, I never really knew him. I have a little memory of him, but he died when I was two or three. Um, and, and are there other like Benedict cousins and stuff like that that came here or? Not that I'm aware of. Like it was just this this kind of one branch of us. It ends with you, right? Yeah, it kind of does. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, you know, you gotta you gotta move on uh, at at some point. But I I love the hill. I mean, it's um uh it it was it you know it was uh I had an ambiguous relationship with Hill, um you know kind of sixth form year and and in college and stuff. Um, and I, you know, you know, that kind of juvenile, like, you know, they were so mean to me kind of thing, but it was, it, you know, it was, it was the discipline was, I mean, just the mental discipline, right? I don't mean like punishment. I just mean the mental discipline that was demanded by the school and the way the school rewarded, um, my response to that discipline was life-changing the fact that i you know my brother was an athlete he was a good athlete you know i could you know you go through the 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 uh uh gym and there he is you know football and you know there's my dad on the football team and there's my brother wrestling team hockey team and you know it, it's not obvious from my chiseled physique but i'm not much of an athlete and um the school so um powerfully rewarded what I what I was good at doing um you know that I didn't I didn't end up you know being much in my dad's shadow or my brother's shadow I mean I really had I really had my own thing um and then in in fifth and sixth form I became I, I sort of uh apprenticed myself to Rick Hilton um and uh, uh and he he actually he was the person who pointed out to me I had written a story. It's probably in the record somewhere. I'd written some story about some kid in France in during World War II and the cathedral. He was a uh, an altar boy and got bombed and and uh, making up uh, your epic adventures again. Well, well, that was, it was pretty epic. I mean, but but Rick pointed out to me. He says, "Well, you know, you're not French. You don't live in the '40s. You didn't live through the Second World War. You're not a Catholic. Like you know, you you have kind of an interesting biography." that people might be interested in reading about. And so I wrote a story called Gigging, which was actually about the night I left for, um, uh, for uh, uh, to go to the hill, like the night before I left to go to the hill. It was about a kid 
who was going away to prep school and a kid who was staying in West Virginia, who was based very much on my best friend at the time. And they go frog gigging at a pond that was, you know, it's the pond on my family's farm. And they use homemade gigs, bamboo poles with nails lashed to them with wire. And they're gigging frogs and sort of working out their relationship. And what is it, what is it going to do to their friendship that they grew up together on this piece of property and now one of them's going away and one of them is going to stay. And so I wrote that story for Rick after he told me, you know, write about your own background. And that's the story that got me into the creative writing program at Princeton and that got me into Joyce Carol Oates's class. Yeah. So my writing life, I mean, absolutely came out of, you know, the, the things I did to get into the Hill, the things I did while I was there and the things I took with me yeah. uh, when I left. Well, let, let's jump ahead because um, I know we're going to have some questions here in a few minutes. And so as our, we've got a number of people on the webcast here. If you're interested in asking Pinkney a question, please uh, start typing them into the Q&A box and then, uh, or raise your hand. But I want to jump ahead to what you're doing now. Um, so mm -hmm. you obviously taught, you've written, you've done a lot of things, but you're, it seems like your career has taken a pretty interesting turn in the last yeah. you know, five, oh, five, five, six years where you're you're doing this very cutting edge work or what I would consider cutting edge work. Um, I think it is. I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't think I'm, I'm flattering myself. I mean, and it's, you know, it's the school is giving me a lot of support for it. Uh, but yeah, I, I have um, founded, uh, um, well, founded sounds so, I mean, I, I put in for grants and I had the idea for um, a, a thing that's now called the um, Digital Humanities Lab. Um, of the College of Liberal Arts at uh, Southern Illinois University Carbondale. And it, you know, the first grant I got, we established a podcasting lab. Um, and, you know, of course, we've got a media program here and all that, but we wanted our own facility where we could do experimental work. Um, we really wanted it to be a laboratory for audio work. And um, that did well. We've, we've, you know, we've done well in competitions. We've got a magazine now that we've started an audio magazine and that kind of thing. And so I just kept, you know, get, putting in for grants and stuff like that. And we added, you know, we've added um, uh, uh, virtual reality is now kind of our big thing. Um, uh, we've got a, we've got a big space in, in one of the buildings here, you know, size of a basketball uh, court and we've got you know we've got VR headsets we've got, we've got our students are making stories in virtual reality we've got game design um, uh, kiosks you know places where people can sit and design games we run game jams uh, if any of your students are are um, are coders or or just make games in whatever uh, form digital games doesn't have to be VR. We're uh, Neophyte Studios Network on Twitch, on itch.io, on YouTube. Uh, if you look up Neophyte, we, we run game jams. And I'd love to see games from students at the Hill. And, if, and I'll, I'll tell you secretly, if you say you're from the Hill, I'll, I'll boost you up the rankings. I'm not, I, nepotism. It's really, it's really fascinating, Pinkney, because you're talking about some of the things that we are actually just starting here at Hill. I mean, we're, we, um, you probably saw that we built the new Quadrivium Center, the Shirley Quadrivium Center. And yep. in the lower level of that building, um, which in the old science building, uh, where you may remember a, a room called the Cave, which was like a black box theater. Mm -hmm. We now have a, a full video studio there, but it includes a podcasting studio, mm -hmm. um, television studio. And then on the other end of the building, in the old arts and crafts building, um, on the West End, we have an emerging technologies lab, which you know, is going to be used for things like VR and AR and, yep. and all sorts of projects for our students. So I think our students could really learn a lot from your lab. And it, uh, I, I imagine we could adopt a lot in gaming and game design is, is becoming a huge, huge thing. Yeah. Now, gamification, what we're really working toward here is what we call the classroom of the future, right? Because we, you know, yes, you know, I got vaccinated the other day. We're going to be able to be face to face again, but some changes in pedagogy have taken place and changes. The publishing world is entirely different from what it was even 10 years ago. And so so that's our yeah, that's our idea here is to develop the pedagogy, the storytelling of the future, um, those sorts of things. It's really exciting. But we've yeah. just started it, too. I mean, 
yeah. you, you know, it's, it, this is, and very few places are actually doing a good job with this stuff. So it's, we gotta get, we gotta get you out here once we can all start traveling again and, I'm, I'm, and help and help us develop some of these things. I'm a hundred percent. I would, I would love to help build it. And, and right before we started the show, you were telling me a little bit about your latest personal work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm forgetting the term. It's not a graphic novel, but it's no, it's a similar. visual, a visual novel. A visual um, novel. Right. So and tell I, our listeners here, what is the difference between a visual novel, a graphic novel, and just a plain old novel? Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's open to an, an interpretation, but a visual novel, generally speaking, there are some really popular ones. They tend to be the ones that folks know about are Japanese. If you look up, um, uh, uh, what is it, 428 uh, Shibuya uh, Scramble, um, you know, things like that. And they're, they're just kind of exciting. Um, uh, but the, I guess the big difference is it's what we call born digital. Um, that, that, that publishing now is moving into a born digital stage where the books aren't going to have an analog embodiment, right? So the work I'm doing now, like the, the, book, the new book of stories I've got coming out, which is called um, uh, Papa Whiskey Tango, uh, and it's my new and selected, so it'll be some new stories and some older stories. Um, that's going to, you know, it'll have a paper version and a Kindle version and so on and so forth. Um, Rise and Slaughter, the visual novel, will never have anything but a, but a digital version. It will never exist in a, visual, in a physical version. And that means that I can, I can work with animation. I can work with sound. Um, I can work, you know, I can create a version that's 2D. I can create a version that is, works in VR. Um, so I can have a number of different versions that people can encounter in, in different ways. So it's, I don't know, what would you call that? Chimerical, maybe. Yeah. And do you think, I mean, you've, you've written in a traditional sense, right? Like originally, you know, most of your work has been written. Do you think you'll ever go back or are you done? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, believe it or not, there's not a huge market for uh, literary short stories about kids growing up in West Virginia, which, which is I'm <laughs> shocked. I'm it's shocked. Really stunning. It's stunning. I thought I was going to be so wealthy, you know, because but it turns out I'm able to corner the market on that because there's no interest in it. Um, it's such a tiny market. It's very easy to corner. So, um, but I, but I'm, it, you know, it's it's um, it's one of those deals where I, you know, I want to have an audience and I want my students to have an audience. And there's no way I can teach them how to do the born digital stuff unless I'm also doing. It. And so it's just it's just in order to teach my students stuff that's going to be valuable to them. I can't teach them what it was like to publish in 1987. That won't help them. That world is utterly gone. And so my hope is to, to help them develop and to develop myself ways of using because it turns out that every skill I ever learned at the Hill, at Princeton, at Iowa, every narrative skill I ever learned works in any narrative form. And so, so the idea then is that we go to the heart of narrative. We don't worry so much about what the form will be. Like I've, I've had students do brilliant work on TikTok, right? I've got, a, I've got a student who did a five um, TikTok, you know, so a five minute series about motherhood, about the death of her mother and the birth of her daughter and the gap between them on TikTok that was just shattered. It was, it was poetry. Um, so, so even the idea is that even trivial forms or what we imagine now are trivial forms can be used to make non-trivial work um, and to make profoundly emotional and powerful, powerful work. And what, what was the tipping point for you? Like, were you like, did, did something, did you experience something that made you say, wow, this is the way this is headed? Or was it like a slow evolution? I think it was, from it was like, a, it was a I, I can't write any more about West Virginia <laughs> to like, <laughs> the, the I got Of course, else. my visual novel is about West Virginia. Of course, it has to be, right? So you got to keep thing. that word well, in nothing else. Like, I, that is my one play. Uh, but, 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 um, yeah, it, it's, um, uh, it was a slow evolution because in, in, you know, sort of legit lit, Right to say, oh, I'm yeah, I'm running an MFA, but we've got a game design lab. Is a that's a you know, I mean, you would think five years ago when I said that kind of thing, oh, here's my ambition. You you would have thought I spat on the floor, 
um, at a, you know, at a department meeting or, or anything like that. The beauty of the collapse of higher ed is folks are now realizing, oh, we can't just do the same thing we've done since the 70s. And so it opened up possibilities for me in my pedagogy and, and, and then my art kind of followed my pedagogy. Got it. All right, well, we've, uh, we've spent 45 minutes chatting. It's time to hear from our audience. Um, so if you're there and still with us and, and uh, you have questions outside of the realm of West Virginia, although you can certainly ask about West if Virginia. It's outside the realm of West Virginia, I may not have an answer. I mean, <laughs> so but please, I'm a professor, so I'll make up an answer and it'll probably be long. <laughs> so please uh, raise your hand and we can call on you or type a, Q &A, uh, type a question into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom right of your screen. Um, we have our first, uh, it's actually more of a comment, but from one of your classmates, Marshall Welch. Uh, hey, Marshall. Who, How's it going, Marshall man? has a son here at the Hill now, Mar Marsh Jr. Yeah. Uh, great to see you. Hope to see you at the 40th reunion in June 2022. That's right. It's and coming right. So share your hairstyle with the headmaster. Be well, Marshall Welch. Well, well bless you, Marshall. That's it's really nice to... Nice to, to hear from you. That was Marshall was one of those guys who was intimidating when I was a kid because he wrestled, just, right? He was a wrestler. He, yeah. And he just seemed to have it together. You know what I mean? Like he looked cool and people liked him and, and uh, you know, and you just, you, you kind of wanted to be Marshall Welch, but you kind of wow. hated Marshall Welch for, for being Marshall Welch when you weren't. And was, I had a very complicated relationship with Marshall <laughs> Welch, which he I'm sure he had a complicated about. relationship with you. It sounds like you had, <laughs> You had a lot more issues. Marshall, you got to now, we, we got to like unmute you, Marshall, and like hear what this relationship is about. I'm going to see if he'll. Oh, well, he knew nothing about it. I feel confident. I'm letting um, him talk here. I'm seeing if he's going to talk. Marshall, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Hey, <laughs> he's there. Marshall, what, what do you know about this, uh, this tormented relationship that Pinkney had with you? Well, listen, the, the, the tormented relationship is actually in reverse. You see, when I was at the Hill, I actually, I got confused. I thought a 4.0 was supposed to be a really good grade point average. And that, that, then I went to college and, and, and uh, yeah, I just, clearly I got confused because my grade point was closer to a 4.0 than a 1.0. And here I thought I was doing well. <laughs> well, and probably so did the college. I mean, I remember having to explain that. Uh, you know, our grading system to to universities, because, yeah, like a 1.4 did not seem good to them at all. Who who, who on earth came up with a zero the, to eight? It's British. I assume oh. it's British. It's, it's British. Yes. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Uh, yep. Everything at Hill was British for a while, right? The no, it was a very, oh. yeah, it was very Anglophile uh, kind of school. And we, uh, I remember Dr. Groton, I won't, I won't say his name, but a member of our class, a guy I love, uh, but but he, uh, I remember he fell asleep in class or something like that in a Greek class, and it was only three of us, and Dr. Groton says, take an eight, and, and I, I, that's, that's a take an eight, it just always, it's so, uh, like, I mean, it just sounds like what it is, it sounds like yeah. opening the doors to hell and tossing you through. Marshall, do you have any questions for Pinkney now that we've got, we've got you on here? But no, but just a quick comment and, and for the people who are listening, I think that's the beauty of the Hill is that I looked at Pinckney and I looked at a gentleman who, who Pinckney brought up, uh, Eugene Yegen Chen, um, oh. who was my German class and was, you know, top of the school for a couple of three that years guy, man, that we were there. Guy. And here I am, you know, I, I was an athlete. I played soccer and lacrosse and was an absolutely horrible ice hockey player. Um, and, uh, and I looked at these guys with such admiration of how they excelled academically and we all excelled in our own ways and our own balance. And uh, to look back now, almost 40 years later, um, obviously I'm, I'm flattered by Pinckney's uh, comment, but, but, um, but the same holds true absolutely um, in reverse, how these guys got, you know, 0 0.5 and 1.0 grade point averages and, and held it all together, especially um, for me, the classics were, completely foreign um you know I, I struggled with those things and excelled in in other classes but to have dr urilla who i also admire greatly um and 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 to excel academically like pinkney did is is certainly uh certainly admirable 
Well, I, no, I, I, I love that. A lot, a lot of idiosyncrasy um, was allowed. I mean, we we really were idiosyncratic, and we were allowed to. There, there were a lot of different paths by which you you could succeed. Um, but a question for you, since, since you teach, how do you feel that the liberal arts? So, so for a student who's going to the hill, how do you feel like the liberal arts education is going to be affected going forward, um, and and how the hill prepares a, a student for the current form of the liberal arts, which I think is a little bit different than you know thirty five years ago when we were in undergrad. Well, it's, um, the, the, I mean, for me, my pedagogy is all about storytelling and narrative in any, and I'm completely agnostic about subject matter or form, um, but it's about making um, chaos coherent, right? Taking what appears to be a chaotic world, a world that is unpredictable and unknowable and rendering, it, it, rendering uh, meaning through narrative, right? whether it's the story I tell myself about how I got through the hill, right? Which probably didn't have the kind of structure I impose on it, but that's how I make sense of how I went through the hill or Princeton or wherever. And that's always going to be, I mean, we, you know, we had, a, we had a woman from Apple here looking at our lab um, uh, not too long ago. And she's, you know, she's a big deal at Apple. And so, but what she told us was, she said, you know, I'll tell you uh, quietly, Apple doesn't need more coders and more programmers. We've got the best coders and programmers in the world. What we need are storytellers. What we need is folks who can, who can communicate the story of what it is that we do. Um, and I think that's not, you know, another a guy named uh, 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 Toby Redshaw, who's a senior VP at, uh, uh, at Verizon, who's he runs, he's running their 5G rollout. He's running, uh, he's in charge of innovation there. And he just says straight up, the people I, I'm hiring now are people who can, who can make the story, who can communicate the narrative of what it is we're doing at Verizon. So I think it's, it's, it's not just folks who want to be writers. And I love that, but that's obviously always going to be a tiny minority of my students. But if my students can make sense out of their lives and can make you know, narrative sense out of their lives, out of the lives of others and out of you know, the work that they have to do, they'll always have jobs. And the way we do that is by reading back into the past. You know, and, and you know, I'm very deeply connected to the past. I'm, in fact, building a partnership now. We're about to make, try to make a hire. <laughs> if my department chair is listening, he might be surprised by this, but I want to make a hire that's a cross hire between, uh, between classics and um, uh, creative writing fiction. Um, I want to hire somebody who can do both and who can do the, the VR stuff, who can do the stuff in the lab um, so that we, can, we have that deep connection to the past and we, and we build that narrative all the way through and we say, you know, this is the human narrative. And, and if we can do that, that seems to me an incredibly valuable, uh, uh, an incredibly valuable asset for people to be able to carry out into the world. Well, and I think Marshall's question is a good one. And, and you know, I, I have my own boarding school experience, which it sounds a lot similar to both of yours in terms of um, just great preparation. And, and I hear it from other Hill alumni all the time. And we've heard it on this show, you know, Hill prepared me, everything was easy after this. The structure, yep. the rigor, the intellectual uh, debate, the, the diversity of the experience, you know, the perspectives. Um, but I think one thing that I've also heard consistently and as recently as, you know, our current students is you don't realize how well you learn to write here. Yeah, um, oh, it's a writing school. And, and when you get to college and when you get to grad school, people, not many people have learned to write this well. Um, grammar, prose, narrative, storytelling, and it doesn't really matter. And I think Pinkney, you've proven it tonight, which is if, if you can write well, you can write in any medium. That's your, that's in that's any industry, ticket to ride. you gotta write. Yeah. That is absolutely your ticket to ride is to be able to, to communicate, to, to be able to, and communication, nobody wants information, right? I mean, people will say they want information, but what they want is 
information made into a coherent narrative, a coherent story. Yeah. Um, and people who can do that well are, are incredibly valuable in many ways. I mean, they're valuable in humane ways, they're valuable in business, they're valuable in education. But no, 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 your people can write. I mean, having judged the Ravel for, for some years now, the fiction and I've seen the nonfiction and I've seen the poetry. No, no, no. You're, you're turning out people who can really. Maybe, maybe we need to add a podcasting category. Well, that that's, I think th actually there was a, a sort of a small podcasting uh, uh, part last year and I'm hoping that blows up because that's. Uh, but it has blown up for us. We had a podcasting uh, during our H term, which was sort of our winter lewd that we did here during. Um, I, yeah. I talked, I talked to that class. Yeah. yeah. That's uh yeah. So they're no, doing no, no, that that's, and, and Ned Ide is doing a creative. Yeah. Uh, no, Ned was, and, uh, I really liked working with him. And Ed he, Turner, one of our classic teachers doing some podcasting and yep. obviously I'm doing some podcasting here in a way. Yep. Um, well, Marshall, thanks for coming on and chatting. Yes, we have another uh, adoration from one of your classmates here, Doug, Doug McKinnon. Oh, says, hey, wow. Pinkney, Doug McKinnon from 82 as well. I occasionally illustrated some of Pinkney's stories in the record. Yep. Great to see you and fun to hear some names from the Hill. Hey to Marshall too. So do you remember some of those illustrations? Oh yeah, no, 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 that's that's so funny. But But no, that's exactly right. And that's in a way kind of what I'm, doing now right is marrying image to to prose and narrative and and that kind of thing but no no i remember really being envious you know that i mean i was a person who i was always pretty verbal but but i, I can't draw a stick figure and i remember being you know re just really wanting that skill to and if i remember right didn't you i think you designed a doug didn't you design a hat for me that had my uh uh, my truck on it that that scout it's just uh, that here i'll is. tell you what pinkney i uh, it's great to hear you and it's terrific but uh i don't remember that but i remember a ferret a story that you wrote about somebody uh, uh had a ferret in a sack and i was just i had this visual and i didn't even know what a ferret was i had to look <laughs> it up at that point uh i probably went to the library and you know checked out a dictionary and you were like, yeah, it's a, it's a ferret. And uh, that I remember vividly. Uh, I still have that hanging around here somewhere in a box. But well, I'm going to have uh, to go back into my, my uh, Hill, uh, the record copies that I have and, and find that. But I absolutely it's remember that. so funny, because though, the way, like you a, know. It was like a dark patch at the bottom of the sack because the ferret was kind of chewing its way out of the sack. If I'm that is correct. Okay. Yep. Now I remember I can absolutely picture that, that <laughs> snack in my in so anyways, my... that was that was a lot of fun and, and helped me get into the record a few times, certainly, uh, which was which was a lot of fun. But uh no, it's just great to hear you. Uh don't really have any questions, although I'm I'm fascinated with the podcasting aspect of things and uh can't wait to see your your visual novel. That sounds uh, uh outstanding. So really right. excited. Well, Thank you. Well, it's really it's great to hear from you, Doug. Hey, well, good to hear from you, too. Thanks for coming on, Doug. You're welcome. Well, we have another uh, 82. They really got, it came out tonight. Pat Madden. Oh, and, my uh, God. Pat Patrick Madden. Madden. Who is, uh, he, his daughter went to Hill, and his son is applying for PG years, so they're going to, uh, you know, here tomorrow. Uh, Pat says, why not write a novel on going to prep school in the early 80s? sort of a more modern version of Catcher in the Rye. Per Mr. Hilton, you certainly have a unique perspective on that. Hey to Marshall, Doug M, hope to see you guys at the 40th reunion, Pat Madden, 82. Yeah, Pat, and I I, I think of Pat every time I stop by, uh, uh, sometimes on my way through Kentucky, I stop by the pavilion. Oh, I can't remember what it, I can't remember what it is, but it's a pavilion that, that was uh, built, I think, on part of his family's, uh, part of his family's place and, and you drive on the roads that are have the names of all the famous horses that his uh uh that his family raised and trained and stuff like that and there also. myself pat you're you're on tell us about the pavilion well <laughs> that's what i've been doing since graduation pygmy that's yeah that's my development all that that's what i've done so <laughs> but but thank you for stopping there 
I bet you go to the Chick Fil A probably. Well, Chick Fil A, <laughs> but but my wife loves Bonefish Grill, and we do not get to. I live out in the middle of nowhere, man, and the nearest Bonefish Grill is probably in St. Louis or Memphis, and so yeah, we go we go to bon, Bonefish Grill for for dinner before we go to you know whatever whatever. Well, call, uh, well, Pinkney, I'm my office is is 400 yards from there. Call me up. When you're coming <laughs> I, I there. will. Well, all right. Well, next time <laughs> next time we're gonna be there, we will. Uh, uh we, we will we will come by but but yeah with that that's I, I i love that place and it's it's really nice so what do you think well, of pat's I, what do you think of pat's idea to write a novel about? well you know i've thought about that for a long long time and it's funny to me that i haven't written about that really since that story i wrote while i was at the hill the the story about gigging with a buddy and i i worry i guess that it's been you know when you go to the hill like and you know and the book the old school comes out you kind of wonder like you know do i want to get into toby wolf's uh you know do i want to like get into his territory you know and is there anything still to be said yeah but but no, there probably is pat and i'm probably just uh it but it's but it's funny i've thought about that many many times and uh now maybe this visual novel will free me up from the from the uh, uh, hillbilly stuff, and I can uh, uh, I can I can write some about the hill because I would like to write about what it was like. Like I had I don't think I'd ever met anyone Jewish until I was uh, in the second form, and there was a guy who lived across the hall, and I remember you know we were all talking about you know oh I'm an Episcopalian I'm a whatever, and he said I'm a heeb, and I and I remember not really knowing like like thing like oh i i you know i don't i'm not sure you know does he mean hebrew i didn't really you know what i mean and he was being funny and and you know uh, you know and that kind of thing but it was anyway it was just such an eye opener for me to be in school with these you know these kids from really sophisticated families you know and and you know and, and are you including pat in that category because i'm not sure pat would agree Oh, well, Pat, I mean, Pat was always just, you know, Pat was one of these guys who, again, you know, tall, handsome, you know, obviously well-raised, not a West Virginian, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and always, uh, as I remember, you know, there'd be a dance and, and Pat would be like, oh, well, there are these two girls, you know, and they'd be these six foot tall uh, girls, you know, and the rest of us are just Pat, Pat, Pat's still on here. Pat, do you remember all of this? Is this is this an accurate reflection of your Hill experience? I, I wouldn't go that far. No, what I remember, <laughs> I remember being in honors English class with Pinckney, and I shouldn't have been in honors English class one year. And I remember Mr. Condren got mad at all of us yeah. over over this exam, and he and then he said, "You all just totally missed this question." And then he read this answer. And I thought like, oh, that must be the model answer. And then he goes, that was Mr. Benedict's answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, what am I doing in here? <laughs> this is well, that and and if I'm remembering the same thing, that was about that was about a uh, a Shakespearean sonnet uh, that, that talked about so you know so long as these lines, uh, you know, so long you will live. And it took me a long time to realize because the question was something like, what does these lines refer to? And I was like, lines on your face, what? And I was like, oh, the lines of the poem. And that was a real breakthrough moment. Probably not the same moment, but I will choose to think that you and I both remember that moment. Well, I remember the moment of feeling very inadequate sitting next to you in English class. That's what I remember. <laughs> like I said, I shouldn't so have been funny in that, You know, we all, everybody was looking at everybody else going, man, that guy really has the life. He's really got it together, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but, you know, well, we, Pat, we Pat, thanks for coming on the show and listening in and good luck to Michael tomorrow and uh, three o'clock, right. three o'clock right, well, when the decisions come out. Okay. But Pinkney, write that novel, please. I really no, would like no. to read that. Now that you've said that I, I will, you know, having been told by Pat Madden, what I need to do, I will, uh, I, I, I take that very seriously and I will carry that forward. Okay. Thanks guys. Okay. Good to catch up with you, Pat. Right. Yep. Bye. Yep. Bye bye. Uh, well, we've uh, we've we've used up our hour here. This has been fun. Uh, we haven't had on our previous shows. We hadn't had so many alumni calling in and and chatting it up. So, well, this, maybe, was, this has been this fantastic. was great. I love yeah. I love I love hearing from these guys. Well, uh, clearly the uh, mutual admiration club is is uh, a big one in your group, and 
sounds like you're i'm looking forward to your reunion next year sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah no 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 that will that will be fun i've i've got a i've got a 40 years who who would have thought who would have thought well pinkney thanks for closing up our series uh so Absolutely. so well um uh, i'm gonna have to go back and look in the record and see how far away you were, were from that 1.0 and uh um we'll uh we'll We'll look for we'll look forward to seeing you down the road this spring with yeah. our writing competitions and hopefully get you to campus sometime next yeah. year to Any, anything i can do program. for your uh for your tech uh for your tech program i'm more than happy to and, and i'm teaching next year pinkney i'm teaching filmmaking and visual storytelling so oh well you then you get to be my get one of my guest speakers yep no i'd be be more than happy to do it just give a shout great well thank you for everyone for joining us on the webcast uh thanks for being here we've had a lot of regular listeners and, and viewers and uh, for all of you who are waiting on pins and needles for your acceptances tomorrow good luck to you and uh, you know we're, we're, we're glad that you tuned in have a great night everybody enjoy Bye -bye. your evening <laughs>